Jag kör med den nu. sophisticated errors and eventually there was a, a, a race towards a point where the copy programs could not catch up because they introduced errors that were so complex that they could not be reproduced by the 1541 disk drive you needed a professional replication uh, equipment to uh, duplicate them so we couldn't uh, duplicate them the originals so they had to be cracked okay on the moral and, and incentive parts of cracking, why did we do it? Everybody had their own reasons, okay? I'll, I'll dwell over a few here. Puzzle solving. A number of us are driven by the challenge of cracking a game or, or developing that specific routine that does a specific thing. We want to overcome that challenge. Sudoku on steroids or people lockpicking or people hacking systems. It's to do it. Proving that you can do it. 
And then there is, of, of course, the ego, which is one of the things I don't understand in today's cracking scene, where you have original supplied by Fairlight, cracked by Fairlight. Who? That's a group, that's not a person. Whose ego is endorsed by releasing something under a group name where they're not seen as an individual? I don't get this. I get it when I'm on stage, I get it when I have my name on that intro. I don't get it if only the group is visible, but that's today. And the sense of belonging. I'll show you a picture. Male belonging. Guys hugging one another. What? What's that? I don't control the volume. Ask the guy with the volume. Sense of belonging is you need... Uh, it, you play in a team, you want to have a, a fair position in a team, you want to be part of a team, you want to enjoy your friends. So you need to be really good at something to fit into that team. If you're a football player, you, there are a number of posts you can play in that football team. The same with the groups. If you want to be in a group, you need to be good at something. What else are you? You need to justify your spot in the group. So the sense of belonging and cracking is one of the arts you can excel in. And then there is sort of the anarchist left wing. Fight the software houses in the belief that copyright is shit. Yeah, feel free to do that. I find that a stupid argument, but... Uh, and whatever reason you have. What's your reason? What's your reason? What's your reason? Okay, more on tapes. Isn't it beautiful? That made our Commodore 64 affordable, because we could have standard tapes with this very cheap equipment. So analog prevents storage from being tape to tape copied. Also, the loaders had a proprietary format, so there is no like OS copier you could use. There is no such thing. And everything out to start, so you cannot just load the game and store it to another tape. So tape in itself is an efficient protection method. So how do you crack it? Well, f you make a single file version uh, that, that could be loaded and saved any number of times and you can place it on a disk, you can copy it to a disk, you can copy it to a tape. It's taken out of its prison. Uh, one of the things that I, two days ago, got really interested in is, are there multi-loaded cracked tape games? Anybody ever heard of that? Does anybody have like uh, a cracked version of s summer games? No? Yeah. You do? Okay. I, I think he said yes for another reason. I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay. Great. So this is the really technical part. How do you tape crack? It's really the art of skills, experience, and improvise, improvisation. The only thing you can learn is two scissors. One is to 63276. That loads the tape header. Then you can fiddle with the tape header. And then you do sys 62828. That loads the header based on the, on the um, sorry, that loads the file based on the header information that you just modified. The rest is art. Okay, and what are the, the, the technical methods that they use to actually make it more difficult? First of all, the game auto starts. Secondly, a number of files are overloaded. So if you start patching, they would load over an unpatched version and all your patches are gone in the process. Encryption. I will get back to this. Some of the more sophisticated ones are decrypting parts of the code running it, and then trashing what they've just been running. So if you freeze it or reset or, or access it in any way, you can only see a small portion because the rest is trashed or still encrypted. Uh, yeah. All right. That's me getting ahead of it. And many times when you crack the uh, uh, tape, the loader system was sort of a standard one. There are only a, a limited number of loaders. Very few made their own loaders. So what you typically did was that you made your own tape transfer. So the next time you were fighting over cyber load, you had your own cyber buster that allowed you to extract 
stuff from tape and you didn't need to go through the process of actually following the logic of the of the go of the game you just transfer it and then you can make your cracked version um, in a few weeks months not really sure there is a, a, a magazine called uh, Data magazine retro issue number two uh, I will have an, an article that goes through cracking of cyberload so there will be detailed instruction on how to crack cyberload the game is actually Hunter's Moon, uh, which is what you see here as well. And I just learned this week that they are remaking Hunter's Moon. So it probably was a really stupid choice of a game. I hope there will be no issues as a result of that. But feel free to buy the magazine if you want to dwell into the topic. All right, more on discs. The beautiful, beautiful 1541. The 1541 is a computer of its own. It has uh, the sort of the same CPU as, as the C64. It has the same side of, of uh, timer circuit. It's, it's actually 6522 rather than 6526, but it, well, it doesn't really matter. It's basically the same. You code the same. You, you have a restricted RAM, but that's sort of it. But you can program it like you program the C64. If you think of the PC or the Amiga, they have a stupid piece of hardware and you read it from your OS, so it's, it's, it's in the same machine. Whereas here you have a separate machine and you communicate serially with it. Okay, um, if data is stored using the normal operation system, then you can copy it. That's, that's standard format. You don't need to go down to the level of the analog storage on the, on the disk because the, there is a standard format and there are any number of copy programs that can handle that. Uh, so, again, introducing errors was the thing, what they had to do. Uh, and I already cheated on this one. So, uh, protection eventually grew to a point where they cannot be replicated on the 1541 themselves. On the, on the 1540, oh, sorry, on the five and a quarter disks, there is a little hole. And if you have a PC, you can read uh, every lap because you can have a diode there. The 1541 does not have that. So on a PC you can have a perfect sync on a position on dink disks. Whereas on the C64 you can only play sync marks and then you put your track on uh, a sector uh, beyond that. So you cannot tell if you are on 12 o'clock on the disk. You just know that which lap you're on. So what you could do, which is totally impossible to replicate on the 1541, is if you have the sync on one track, then you move the head outwards, and then you have the actual data there. That can never be replicated on a 1541. Oh, all right. The picture should show up a bit later. But so this cracking, I I'm showing you here an example of this uh, trashing and, and uh, encoding. I don't know if you can read it. Um, first of all, you have all the same method as you do on tape. You can overload, you can, uh, you can encrypt and you can decrypt and all of that. And, but the thing is, if you have a freezer cartridge, and a number of people had freezer cartridge on the 64, the disk drive was in a separate computer, right? So that's a separate computer. You cannot ac access it. You can freeze and look into your, your s computer memory, but what is in the disk drive memory? Yeah, it's there. You can't access it. It, it's gone. It's beyond your reach. So you need to ensure that in order to understand what's there, you need to find a spot where you can examine what's going there before it's going there. And this is one of the things that Electronic Arts was particularly good at. Uh, their Pyrus layer boot is probably one of the more difficult protections on the 64. So it loads a protected main file and then there is an 11 layer encryption, decryption, uh, which you can see one instance of here. Uh, if you follow the logic here, the first portion here, I'm not sure if I can point, this thing here, you s no, you don't see that. I'm, I'm pointing on my screen, not your screen. So this, this first portion trashes what was up. So if this is instance five, Instance 4 is gone after that little loop. And then it sets the pointer 
to the address just after the inner loop and then there runs for the rest of the memory right and then you have and it uses timers which means that it's not static values it's it's stuff that changes by the cycle so if you don't run this cycle perfect you're fucked this is quite interesting yeah if you like that kind of thing or it's the most boring thing on earth whatever you choose okay other types of protection shit i already gave one away manual protections stupid games typically like uh, role playing games where you're supposed to enter word number 5 on line number 6 on page 55 yeah that's one of them what do you do fuck it you just delete it remove that piece of code code wheel that's this one okay they give you uh, this is from elvira i think so they give you a number of instructions and then you flip your code wheel and you read what the code wheel says and then you enter that and you're good to go what do you do fuck it remove it compiled basic hmm stuff written in basic and then they compile it and they release it as a game should be illegal if you're lucky you have a decompiler so you can make it into basic again if you don't have that then you're fucked compile basic is shit don't do it okay more on cracking do I need to understand how data is stored on disk and tape? Hell no, I'm clueless. I, I've, I think I've cracked 300 games or so. I have no idea how tapes work. I have a rough understanding how disks work. If you ask me to write a tape turbo, it will take me forever because I have no idea how you do it. I know how to defeat them. I don't know the other shit. So what do I need to know? I obviously don't need to know anything about the format on the disk and tape. Well, you need to know everything about the CPU. Uh, you need to code reasonably well on the 64, I would say, including illegal opcodes. Uh, I should have pointed that one out. There is, of course, illegal opcodes. These are opcodes not officially supported by the CPU. You're kind of using glitches, and, and anyone coding demos are used to using glitches of the C64. That's sort of the beauty of it. And you need a, a separate set of tools to do what you want cracking up isn't that a hilarious picture for this okay cracking a one filer a one filer is a program which will not require any additional data from the media once you loaded it you load it and then you're done the lamer would be able to freeze this one this is not what we're going to do so first of all you identify the segment it loads I'll get back to why. And then you store them away as you load them. And then, you, of course, you need to identify the start address. Where does this game start? And then you need to develop a trainer. So you look through the game, and you play through the game, and you find a number of cheats for the game. Because eventually, we're going to play through the game to ensure that it works 100%. That's why I hate playing games by the game way, because I've spent 300, I've sp I played 300 games to the end with cheats and after that games aren't funny anymore all right then you rle pack and run length encoding is a packing mechanism wick mechanism which reduces long sequences of the same byte so this is why we wanted the segments we want to clear everything out in between so we can rle and pack very efficiently and then the trainer, of course, jumps to the start. So then the RLE packer would jump to your trainer menu. So that is the first thing that starts. And then you add an intro. You want to tag the shit or it's not worth putting it out. And then you crunch. So that's a sequence cruncher, finding equal repetition of data within, within the program. Typically, it's based on LZ77 or something similar. Okay, and what are RLE packers? I, I just took from my own utility disk a number of examples of the ones I used. EBC, equal byte compressor, nice program by triangle, my personal edition of it. And sequence crunchers. So dark squeezer, byte boiler, are they familiar names? Otherwise, you could have been using cruel crunch, and then you're really old, I can tell you. 
or you use time crunch, then you're even older. <laughs> uh, and AB crunch is also something by one, by one way. Um, yeah, uh, this is this is not really right. But level crunchers, that's that's for multi-level uh, games, and I'm getting to that. So just showing that the, the crunchers appeared in level versions as well. That's basically crunching the data, storing the data, but not adding the dpacker header on it. Today, you would call your own RLE. Nobody uses somebody else's for some reason. And then you use Exomizer for the rest, because it's fantastic. OK. Adding an intro. This is where we're getting into a little bit of, yes, no? How do I run it? Oh, yeah, it's running. So here we're running the I Fairlight Intro Maker. Secret stuff, never shown in public before. I'm letting this hang so you can hear more of the tune. Spice, spice, spice. Yeah, some say that that is actually bugged. It doesn't sound exactly like the Druid 2 original. We made it better. <laughs> or we bugged it, but it sounds nice still. Okay, cracking multi-load is the same. The only thing you need to do is you need to identify the loader and ditch it. So this is what my... <laughs> my children would call a daddy joke. This is a ditched loader. <laughs> okay, and then you need to add your own loader, of course, because if there is no loader, you need to have a loader. And the loaders that we tend to use are speed loaders that include real-time depacking. So it, it decrunches on the fly from the disk and also does it in a faster manner than the standard OS loader. Uh, yeah, that's what I said there. Okay, okay, but the, the creative information wants to be free. That's that's one of the basic foundation and one of the principles that we all uh, like to think that we follow. But there are actually like additional rules or or scene agreements. What you see here on the right is the international standards. There was a, <laughs> a copy party which I hope we will not replicate here in uh, Dani the Danish gold party, epic party where they burned the place to the ground afterwards. Yeah, Bam Bam from Hungary, stay out of him. He will, he will be trouble coming your way. But there is also a current set of rules and, and it's, a, it's a five, six, seven, eight page long document by Jazzcat of Onslaught. Basically it says you should crack to files, not have direct track and sector loading. You should train it, you should upload it to a few selected BBSs. I'm a big fan of ancient technologies such as the C64, but I can't for the living daylight understand why you want the BBS. There are so much nicer and more efficient things. I like the old computer, I, I think BBSs are shit. Okay, I needed to have that said. <laughs> yeah. And it should work on PAL and NTSC. Who uses NTSC? They don't care. So it's only a principle. And it should run on a stock C64. I object to that as well. I think uh, RAM expansion unit uh, support is absolutely fine. And, and if it needs to run on a, with an REU, I think that's fine as well. But again, JazzCat does not agree. So we have a slight disagreement. But these are the rules. If you want to be counted in the official list of launched releases, that's what you need to abide to. Thank you for watching. That's actually what I wanted to say for today.
And of course, I have room for questions. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so, okay, the, the hardest game ever to crack. I'm not saying I cracked the hardest. I think Gor Gordian's Tomb was protected using Timex 3. Siren, what do you say? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a bitch. Uh, I also think that Alternate Reality is one of the games that haven't really been properly cracked. There is also a, a text editor called Paperback Writer. Excellent choice of name, by the way, for anybody understanding their Beatles history. Uh, which is also a bitch. That uses stuff like if you start, if you print, uh, and you haven't, uh, if the cracker hasn't cleared the, vo the, the volume registry, it will crash. How do you crack that so it works in version? You need to print before you realize that you need to do that. So I think that's, that's the three more difficult ones. This uh, Pirate Slayer boot is also a bitch. Uh, running it on an emulator, it's quite easy, but, uh, but uh, the original one, it's, it's impressive those people did it back then. Did I hear what tools do you use? No? Because I prepared extra slides for that particular question, so I'd like that question now, please. <laughs> yes, that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. Uh, so, here. Everybody runs on emulators. Everybody tests them on the stock hardware before you release it. So what I use is Vice plus a monitor, the monitor included in Vice. And then I use Sublime plus Kick Assembler and then Swofas, absolutely magnificent integration that makes them into an IDE. Totally great, totally great. Then there is this one. I need to show you this one. This is C64 Debugger. So what you see here is the Fairlight intro, a, re a, a digital representation of the memory. Memory, that's, you can see it running in real time. Memory viewer as hex codes and also as graphics. N nobody except somebody from Poland would ever do this. So uh, it hats off, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, some some hints on Kick Assembler. Kick Assembler can do a lot more than you potentially think. You can generate your D64s out of the box from from Kick Assembler. Uh, here I have dot disk and then adding the name. So generating the D64, you don't need a separate tool. It's already there. So what I do when I crack is that I have the original data. I do ASM files for uh, patching files, like I import, I patch, and I save them back. Uh, of course, I have ASM file for like the trainers and stuff, so that's my own code. And then I use an ASM file for building the D64, and then I just tie this all together using a bat file. So uh, I just click on that one, and, and then I have a D64 that runs. Totally fluid. Yeah. That is actually all the questions I prepared. So thank you especially for asking that particular question. Here's Great. And there we go with the words of... Um, Somebody from the organizer want to wrap up afterwards or... <laughs> that's what I would have done. So I'm not forcing anyone. <laughs> and that was Bacchus of Fairlight cracking the world. And here's Spot. Thank you very much, Bacchus. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, give the man a hand. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're still twiddling with stuff. I'm sorry about the, the delay. This is Ziphoid live from the Data Storm party in, well, Data Storm summer even, in Gothenburg, Sweden. <laughs> 